Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to Reality Asserts Itself. Recently, Bill Maher accused liberals, American liberals, as being soft on Islam, while they're being hypercritical of the American right. Here's what he had to say. President Obama keeps insisting that ISIS is not Islamic. Well, maybe they don't practice the Muslim faith the same way he does. <laughs> but if vast numbers of Muslims across the world believe, and they do, that humans deserve to die for merely holding a different idea, or drawing a cartoon, or writing a book, or eloping with the wrong person, not only does the Muslim world have something in common with ISIS, it has too much in common with ISIS. To count yourself as a liberal, you have to stand up for liberal principles, free speech, separation of church and state. Freedom to practice any religion or no religion without the threat of violence. Respect for, <laughs> respect for minorities, including homosexuals. Equality for women. It, uh, it amazes me how here in America we go nuts over the tiniest violations of these values, while gross atrocities are ignored across the world. Our guest on Reality Asserts Itself thinks all of that is Islamophobic. And now joining us in the studio to talk about all of this is Deepa Kumar. Deepa is an associate professor of media studies at Rutgers University and also serves as an officer in the teachers union. She's authored two books including Outside the Box, Corporate Media, Globalization and the UPS Strike. And her latest is Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire. She's currently working on her next book titled Constructing the Terrorist Threat, the Cultural Politics of the National Security State. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Now, usually we start with your personal backstory, but because I've already teased the Bill Maher thing, yes. we're going to have to do the Bill Maher thing, and then in the next segment, do the backstory. That sounds good. Because I think people are, they're, everyone's going to want to hear how you trash Bill Maher and why. Yes. So, so what's wrong with what Bill Maher said? Bill Maher is saying that there's a great denial of rights uh, in much of the uh, Muslim world, uh, not just Islamic State, but Saudi Arabia and so on. Um, and there, there isn't a lot of loud critique about it. Um, and, and certainly the American left spends a lot more time critiquing you know, the, the domestic right. Um, so doesn't he have a point? Well, what Bill Maher said is a perfect example of what I call liberal Islamophobia, which is to take up liberal themes such as human rights, women's rights, the rights of gays and lesbians, the right to free speech, and so on, and makes a case of the so-called Muslim world, like, like it is one big monolith in which these rights are uniformly denied to people, and then proceeds to uh, equate, in essence, the politics of ISIS with the politics of the 1.5 uh, billion people who practice Islam. When in fact, you actually look at Muslim majority countries, which is the term that I prefer, they vary widely in terms of, you know, for instance, the status of women. Uh, in Bangladesh, for instance, we've had two women heads of state voted into power, Khalid Azia and uh, Sheikh Hasina. Um, but in Saudi Arabia, women aren't allowed to drive. And so, of course, there are these kinds of uh, examples from Muslim-majority countries like Saudi Arabia, like Iran, where women's rights are restricted. But by focusing just on those and somehow equating this to a problem of Islam, as opposed to a problem of politics, he winds up perpetuating this notion that all Muslims are backward, which is the very essence of Islamophobia. He, he does something else, too, which he, he, he s ascribes essentially fundamentalism about the Quran. And then all Islamists, are, uh, sorry, all believers in Islam are somehow also fundamentalists. Right. But he doesn't do that for Christianity Absolutely. because there's there's just as much craziness in in in, in the Bible uh, as there is in the Quran. I think I don't know. Maybe there may, could be. There's a little more. I don't know. But no, uh, you know, any religious text, whether it's the Quran or the Bible and so on, can be interpreted in, you know, multiple ways. There are progressive interpretations of it, and then there are reactionary interpretations of it. Um, and therefore, you know, I mean, think of this example. Imagine if for every act of terror committed by a Christian fundamentalist, 
you know, a far-right militia person like uh, Michael Wade Page, who went, you know, went to Oak Creek, Wisconsin, and shot a gun at uh, a Sikh temple and killed people and so on. Now imagine if we were to generalize from Michael Wade Page to all of you know, Christendom, to all of the United States and say, now everybody else should denounce this man and distance themselves from uh, him, otherwise you're all culpable. Now that's completely ridiculous. And of course that would be ridiculous if we talk about Christians in the West, but apparently it's completely acceptable when it comes to talking about Muslims. And so even President Obama said moderate Muslims should separate themselves from ISIS and from other groups and so on. Why, in what way, shape or form are regular Muslims responsible for fundamentalism any more than regular Christians are responsible for Christian fundamentalism or regular Jews for Jewish fundamentals. You get the idea. We, we see those people as being the extreme wing of uh, a, a particular religious interpretation. But, but, but is there a, a little reluctance in the American left, especially when it comes to the Islamic State, of being really harsh about what they are. I mean, I don't, you may not want to wor use the word fascistic just because fascism has sort of more modern implications in terms of Europe, but it, it has a lot of things in common in terms of, uh, they seem quite capable of genocide, they seem quite capable of killing people just because of their beliefs. Oh, of course. Uh, I mean, it, it's a pretty barbaric thing. No now, doubt. I just want to add one thing in saying that, just to the audience, they've heard me say this before. Um, there is nothing the Islamic State has done that compares to the barbaric activity that the United States has done in Iraq and on and on, going right back to the atomic bombing of Japan. So, you know, if we're talking scale here, the Islamic State is, is, is a whisper of what the United States has done. That being said, one does not need to hold back on describing IS as, 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 a, as a barbaric, brutal force that the people of the region, on the whole, you would think, will despise, just as much as most Afghans despise the Taliban. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. Um, I, I think that, you know, in, in my book, actually, I have a pretty strong critique of the parties of political Islam. Um, and I don't think we should be soft on that. There was a tendency back in the 1970s, you know, when Foucault goes to uh, fr uh, Iran and so on, to see, uh, particularly in France, there was a tendency to somehow see the Islamists as being progressive and painting with progressive colors, the Iranian revolution uh, and so forth. But I, I don't think that tendency exists anymore. I think if anything, uh, one of the first few pieces that I wrote on this topic is about the left and their attitudes towards uh, political Islam is how um, ignorant the left was in terms of actually uh, Islamophobia and in terms of you know sort of equating the Islamists with all of Islam and you know all of Muslims and so forth. So I think that there is in the United States especially a sort of blind spot around Islamophobia and and, and a lack of a nuanced analysis of who these groups are, why they come to power, and what the historic conditions are for their rise. The, uh, it seems to me wh wh where he is, is, one is this part of where he extends this to anyone who believes in Islam and tries to make Islam itself and come up with some quotes from the Quran that are particularly backward um, is one thing. But the second thing, which is this idea that he, he, he talks about our society having liberal values and free speech and this and that. Uh, you can argue, you know, what that's becoming and with the national surveillance state and so on. But it's still true. I mean, compared to a lot of societies, yes, but I'll take, we, I'll, can, we I'll can have this conversation. Well, let me just sure. finish my point. And we can have this conversation and we're not going to walk out and get arrested. Right. That being said, it's at home you have those things. Mm -hmm. The United States has 50, 60 years of supporting the worst kind of dictatorships everywhere, and particularly in the Middle East with the, supporting the Saudis and so on and so on. There's no support for these kind of values when it conflicts with American interests abroad. Right. Um, the part where I interrupt you, what I was going to say is that the narrative that gets constructed in the West and that Bill Maher and people like that are echoing is the clash of civilizations rhetoric, right, which uh, was coined by Bernard Lewis and then popularized by Samuel Huntington, which is the idea that in the post-Cold War period, conflict would no longer be political, it would be cultural, and that there were you know, seven or eight civilizations, each with their own unique cultures, the West in the Islamic world and so on, and that they are bound to conflict with each other. The problem, I mean, there are any number of problems, it's ahistorical, it's you know, just wrong and so on, but the problem I have with it one problem at least is that 
it negates the fact that the rights that people do have in this country, whether you're talking about workers' rights, the rights of African Americans to vote, the right of women to vote, this didn't happen automatically because some benevolent president decided it's people's movements, it's women fighting for a hundred years and their male allies that caused suffrage, right? And therefore somehow to assume the liberal mantle as being the natural inheritance of what it means to be the West, you know, starting from Greece to the present, and seeing the uh, East, particularly, you know, Muslim majority countries as being mired in barbarism. This is the classic language of colonialism, which whether Bill Maher knows it or not, that is what he's echoing. And in fact, even in the East, you've had, you know, in Iran, in Egypt, you've had feminist movements, you've had women's rights movements, which we barely ever hear of. Well, the roots of this go right back to the, uh, uh, the early days of the Catholic Church and the fighting of, against the, uh, uh, the Crusades and then the Ottoman Empire. I mean, this, it wasn't about liberal values then, it was about the true God and, right. and they got the bad God sure. and we're gonna fight it out. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of, the roots of it are, go, go very deep. Absolutely, which is why the, my book is called Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire. And it starts with the Crusades because every empire needs an enemy. Um, and to, you know, at least one of the motivations for the Crusades was to create this ideal Muslim enemy, which could then motivate people to go out and, you know, fight wars. But it was always, there was always a very contradictory notion of how to look at the East. Because even while the Crusades are going on and you have the most horrific stereotypes of Muslims and all the rest of it, in Al-Andalus, which is the name given to Muslim rule in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and uh, uh, Portugal, you see the most advanced civilization. Remember, Europe is in the Dark Ages at this time, right? And here in Al-Andalus, you have street lighting, you have uh, developments in science, medicine, and so on. In that region, Europeans had a very positive uh, idea of Muslims and what they developed because they had actual contact with them. So typically, this idea of a Muslim enemy works when people have never met anybody from the Middle East or North Africa, or you know, have never traveled and then the stereotypes can work, just as it's working in the case of ISIS and scaring people to death and, you know. But, but I, I think the, 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 one of the things that always gets missed in this conversation in the mainstream media is that these are class societies we're talking about, these are the Muslim societies, Arab societies, and, and in many of them, the classes that are in power are barbaric and they are backward yes. and, and they, they do call up the worst of, of whatever you can call up in Islam. The same way you Absolutely. can find in Christian fanatical regimes in Latin America, you know, and other times. Absolutely. Um, but but you do get us. I, I go back to Mars' point. Even though I think on the, I mean, I agree with you. The way he formulates formulates it is Islamophobic, but there is a, a, a kind of reluctance. Like I, even on Iran, for example. And this is not so much an uh, Islamic issue, although it's a bit of it. Uh, it's th much of the left in the United States is very reluctant to say something critical of the Iranian regime. And the Iranian regime suppresses, I'm not talking liberal now. I okay. mean, Democratic liberals, of course, they trash Iran. I'm talking about the left, uh -huh. uh, who, who only want to talk about U.S. sanctions against Iran and the U.S. aggression against Iran and so on and so on. And they just won't say a word about the way Iranian state suppresses its own people. And, and you get a bit of that, I think that's part of what Mar is trying to put his finger on, even though I think he's doing it in, in a brutal and, you know. I mean, I think there are two ways of doing this, right? Uh, on the one hand, there's the sort of um, Bill Maher way of doing it, which is then to present the US government as, you know, somehow a force for good in the region, right? This is the old white man's burden. But, but uh, when he'll You're talk saying, about the Iraq war, right. he'll, he'll trash American right. policy on Iraq. Right. It's on this issue where he doesn't like what he thinks is a kind of hypocrisy. I mean, I think he's completely naive on how he formulates it. But I would formulate it differently, which is that I certainly have critiques of the dictatorships and of you know, the censorship and of the violation of workers' rights, for instance, in Iran and so on. But the fact of the matter is that you've had very uh, uh, important people from Iran, like Shirin Abadi, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, 
who has, you know, who has exposed the extent of civil rights uh, uh, violations, human rights violations, and so on. And the key, I think, is to have solidarity, international solidarity, and to speak about the problems, whether it's workers' rights, women's rights, what have you, in terms of the how we can get together from a grassroots level to fight back. That's a very different kind of framing, as opposed to Bill Maher saying, well, all of these Muslim societies are no different yeah. from ISIS. Right? I, I think part of it, and I think you mentioned this in the beginning, he, it's completely ahistorical what he says. Like if you're in any of the Muslim countries and you see what American policy in the Middle East has Stupid. been, you are going to, you know, unless you're in the elite and you somehow benefit from it, but even amongst the elites, I think there's going to be resentment. And you're going to have, the, the thing is, is what else is there to have some sympathy for than the Islamist yeah. opposition? Why? Because the American policy and the Israeli policy destroyed the secular opposition. That's right. That's right. Um, and this has been happening, you know, uh, through the course of the Cold War, when it was clear that the secular nationalists, whether you're talking about Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt, or you're talking about Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran, when it was discovered that they couldn't be co-opted to serve the U.S.'s interests in the region, the key policy from 1958 on with the Eisenhower Doctrine was to create an Islamic bulwark to act as a counter to secular nationalism. And, you know, you read, uh, uh, you know, some of the accounts of what the CIA is doing, and they're, they're putting poison into Narsa's cigarettes. Uh, they're trying to put uh, poison into his chocolates. They, you know, some of these sorts of awful things that you think happen only in the movies. But at a very systemic level, what they're doing is funding uh, and sponsoring, you know, all sorts of radical Islamist groups all the way from Iran uh, and across the region. Well, and most importantly, the de it starts with Roosevelt, it's a deal with the Sauds. I yes. mean, the Saudis are the heart of all of this. And this was the deal, that the yes. Saudis would, would, would be the use their defensive Mecca mm -hmm. to be the force to spread Wahhabism throughout the region. Mm -hmm. And all this extremism is part of American policy. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, the language that they used in the State Department is that they wanted the Saudi monarch to be an Islamic pope um, and to use the legitimacy of being the guardians of Mecca and Medina to actually push people away from secularism. So absolutely, and Saudi Arabia had a very systematic program of Islamization, whether it was distributing Korans for free, whether it was giving tons of petrol dollars for setting up you know, madrasas, all over, not just in the Middle East, but even in Pakistan, they set up schools and colleges and you know, send their preachers there and so forth. And uh, the end result is the Mujahideen, is Al-Qaeda. And uh, I mean, I, I think that's really important to bring up because there's a tendency to somehow think of the parties of political Islam as being the sort of logical outcome of this region. You know, this is all that Muslims can produce. But if you don't talk about how left secular alternatives were systematically crushed by the US, by Saudi Arabia, by Israel, and so on, then you don't get a sense that these are people just like anybody else who and, have and a not, range of politics. And not only left secular, they destroyed in Afghanistan a more normal capitalist development. They mm -hmm. had a king that was a modernizer. They wanted to have a more modern capitalism. And they threw it all out the window to suck Russia into a war by, and then arming all the jihadists and, I mean, village elders who, I mean, didn't know anything, give them rocket launchers right. and they become the new power brokers. Absolutely. And then you wonder where the Taliban comes from. Right. In fact, every single reformist and pro-democratic movement that has come into being in the Middle East and North Africa, the U.S. has always been on the wrong side of it. Even in Saudi Arabia, there was, some, there was a modest movement called the Free Princes Movement, where they wanted a constitutional monarchy. Would the U.S. have any of it? Absolutely not. You know, uh, they immediately dispatch forces to you know, make sure these forces are marginalized. There was a workers' movement in the Shia Eastern region trying to form unions, but Aramco, uh, at that time American-owned, uh, would have none of it, and so uh, they got rid of that. So mm -hmm. every step towards creating rights for a whole group of people, from workers to women and so on and so forth, the U.S. has always been on the wrong side, including after the Arab Spring of 2011, right? You look at the role that the U.S. has played, support the dictators till the very last second, and then back the counter-revolutionaries, whether it's Egypt and the military, or it's giving the green light to Saudi Arabia to crush the, you know, the resistance in Bahrain, what have you. The U.S. is always. Or first of all, make a deal with Qatar to have Muslim Brotherhood. Exactly. And then let the, they know if that were to 
perpetuate as a regime, yeah. they weren't headed towards any grand democracy. Right, know? right. Yeah. And so I think that framework is important because then you start to see that the people of the Middle East and North Africa are just like everybody else. They want economic rights, they want political rights, and so on. And if the U.S. just stopped interfering, we would, you know, we would see a flowering of a different kind of society. Okay, so here's a challenge to Bill Maher. So if somebody out there knows Bill Maher, get him to watch this. Because, you know, he's not bad on a lot of things. You know, he's moved, he seems to be kind of evolving in his thinking. But he seems rather stuck on this issue. So anybody knows Bill Maher, and we know we got lots of viewers in L.A. and Hollywood. So shove this thing in front of his eyeballs and see if he has the courage to have Deepa or Deepa and me on the show. And let's talk about this, because so far he's kind of uh, buying into some ignorance. Uh, so we're going to continue this conversation. Please join us for the next part of a Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.